I'm Anatoly Gust, I'm Canada Research Chair and Associate Professor at the Ted Rogers School of Management, which is at Ryerson University in Toronto. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to a session on ethics of using social media data. Today I'm joined by, by my colleagues, Philip Mai, who is Director of Business and Communication at the Social Media Lab, Priya Kumar, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Social Media Lab, and Jenna Jacobson, who is a researcher and project manager on the Social Media Data Stewardship Project. All right, so as you can see in front of you, there are some, some materials that we're going to be using during group discussions, during the second part of our panel. But first, I would like to invite Philip Mike to tell you a little bit more about Social Media Lab and the type of projects we are doing to get this session started. Thank you, Anatoly. So a little bit about our lab. Uh, we're one of the newer labs here in Canada. Um, what we do at the lab, we study how <laughs> social media <laughs> is changing the way people communicate and connect uh, to each other to do business, to conduct our politics, and so on. We are a very interdisciplinary lab. Um, the lab, of course, like I said, uh, is made up of um, quite a few people, uh, Anatoly, myself, a few postdocs, uh, Jenna, uh, project manager, and um, we have everyone from undergraduate all the way up to postdoc in, working in our lab. So at any point, we have about 10 to 12 people in the lab working on five or six different projects at any point in time. We also have research collaborators abroad, uh, across Canada and the US, and in other countries like in Russia and the UK and so on. Our expertise at the lab is that we study online community. Um, we examine what's going on within the community online that causes more community to thrive and more members join on, and another community that start off the same intention, the same resource, die a quiet death, where the nobody is joining uh, the group and it dissipates. So we want to know what's going on within those communities that makes them thrive and what's going on within those communities that is not doing that great. We use a particular, uh, we specialize in a particular um, method to help understand what's going on in these communities. We use something called social network analysis. Um, we also develop a lot of dashboards and information visualization tools to help understand what's going on in the data. So this way it becomes more digestible and um, actionable. Because who has the time to read a million tweets? Right? So we want to develop something that makes it a lot easier for people to digest and then hopefully act on them. Um, we also work with text mining and distributed computing because again, the data sets are getting larger and larger. We have to figure out how to basically capture and store all this stuff, but also analyze it and then serve it up again um, uh, on demand. Okay. I just want to go over some of the projects that we worked on in the past. For example, in the past, we've looked at things like how can social media support communities, social activism, and political engagement. So we looked at the federal election, um, how Twitter and other social media can be used during the federal election um, here in Canada or in the U.S. or the Euromaidan crisis in Ukraine uh, in 2014. We've also looked at things like what does it mean to be influential online? In our day-to-day -day lives, we know. We have markers that when you walk into a room, you meet people, you introduce yourself, you get to know some information about them to decide, is this something you want to follow up on, for example. But online, what are some of the cues that you would use? Because they're not the same cues that you use in day-to-day uh, -day, uh, life. So how would you go about figuring out what those are and put it into an algorithm to help basically just take a look at the, foot, uh, the digital footprint and figure out and determine, is this something influential uh, in the conversation? We've also done a lot of research on how social media is using, um, being used in higher ed, um, in teaching and learning. Um, how can it help uh, improve teaching and learning? Can it help teaching and learning? And some of the other projects includes uh, is happiness uh, or swearing contagious online. If you see somebody swearing on a YouTube um, video, does it cause other people um, who come afterward and saw the same video and saw your comment, does it encourage them to also swear? Um, the other thing that we do at the lab is that we all organize um, a few different um, international conferences and uh, seminars and events. There are two coming up um, this summer. One is the uh, Social Media and Society uh, Conference that we run every year. This is the eighth year. Uh, the registration is open and you're most welcome. Um, and the other conference that's new to, for us this year is the Obetrics Conference. Um, up to now, the impact factor uh, measurement is uh, I guess the gold standard um, in academia is to measure and to signify the impact of your research. 
But now with the availability of social media, blogs, and other media outlets, there are groups of research out there trying to figure out, is there a way to improve on the impact factor or add to the impact factor using alter alternative metrics? Trying to figure out how much is a tweet worth about your paper? Should we, um, how much weight do we give to that? Um, should um, a blog post, a mention in the New York Times, a mention in the local paper, how should we go about figuring out um, uh, and figuring out the impact of that piece of research? So there will be about 300 people from around the world that's going to be gathering at Ryzen this fall to basically have a discussion about this, try to figure this out. And lastly, what well, the other thing we do is we use many of the things that we learned from our studies to then develop software for um, the average social media user, but also for other researchers. So all the tools that we develop at the lab are publicly accessible. So for example, one of the tools that we developed um, is called My Tweets. With Twitter, you get to see the tweet of the people who cho you've chosen to follow. But with My Tweets, you get to see the tweet of the people who've chosen to follow you. Because again, that goes back to our focus in our lab of trying to understand community. Your Twitter follower is your Twitter community. They're the one that's most likely to share and pass on the content and introduce you and your content to new um, uh, followers, their followers. So, but you need to know what your followers are interested in right now at this moment so you can join the conversation as opposed to always trying to pull them to your conversation. If you know what they're interested in, you can join their conversation. So this dashboard is designed to help you figure that out um, in real time. The other tool that we developed um, that Anthony um, and other members of the lab have developed in the last eight, nine years now is called Netlytic. It's a tool to help people who are not um, who know well versed in computer programming, basically, so they can capture and get their own data. They have the questions and they want to uh, answer those questions. So they come and use this tool. You can get pull data down from uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and so on. You don't have to learn any programming. Once the data is pulled down, you can use our tool to do social network analysis with it, or you can do text analysis with it. And if that's not enough, or you want to explore and use other tools, you can export the data set and use it in other tools. Um, and lastly, uh, another um, project we're working on is something called Poly Dashboard. It's a live Twitter dashboard. So unlike the other two where the data's a bit static, here this is live. So if you're monitoring a particular hashtag, as new um, tweets come online, as people tweet, the dashboard reconfigure itself and show you the up most up-to-date, minute-by-minute data of what's going on that um, hashtag. Um, so basically it gives people, let's say if you're running a political campaign, a live um, uh, dashboard that tells you exactly what people are saying about your campaign in real time. And for those of you who are doing research um, in social media, we at the lab also maintain this list of 50 peer-tested, peer-reviewed tools. So any tools that have been used um, in peer-reviewed um, uh, publications are featured here. They have to be at least one peer-reviewed publication to be on tools. So there, uh, you won't find tools that are geared towards marketers and so on. Um, the website right there, and we constantly update this. So every six months, we go through the list again to see whether any of them is out of date or is no longer online. So we remove those, and then we add new ones as they come online. So next, I'm going to turn it back to Anatoly uh, to talk more about the social media data exclusion project. Thank you, Philip. Thank you for this introduction. And so my role is to tell you a little bit more about the project that uh, we're doing right now, which we call social media data stewardship. I will define the term and walk you through some of the steps in, in this uh, framework. And then I will invite my colleague Priya Kumar, who will focus specifically on, on ethical issues of using social media data for research, which will situate us in, and prepare us for the group activity, which will, Jenna will then uh, moderate. All right, so as people join in more and more social media sites, they also contribute in more data to those websites, and they contribute in to, to the creation of large live data sets that collects uh, user data as well as machine-created uh, data. And so that makes it very uh, challenging, but also important for consumers of such data, such as us researchers, to understand and pr properly handle such social media data sets. So what we're trying to do in this project is to uh, understand the whole life cycle of collecting, accessing, collecting, analyzing, and preserving social media data uh, for research purposes. And we're trying to answer these questions from multiple perspectives, from data producers' perspective, who are users, as well as data consumers, uh, who are 
uh, using data for uh, various insights. Because this question is very, very multifaceted, we really need to come up and agree on a common framework to discuss questions related to managing social media data. And so what we're proposing, we call in social media data stewardship. And this is, uh, we, uh, we turn into the emerging notion of data stewardship that looks at data practices. And mostly this uh, area of data stewardship look at data pra practices uh, of data emerge from research labs. So labs that work uh, usually in hard sciences area. Because uh, this notion of data stewardship already covering a lot of aspects of managing all various types of data, we think it's very appropriate to apply it to social media type, data type. But we also realize that social media data is somewhat different from the data that somebody would generate in a lab environment. Why? Because social media data has been generated by users. It's been curated by platforms. So there are a lot of stakeholders involved in creation of this data. And so that's why we're trying to look at the notion of social media data stewardship, not just from technical perspective, but also from the policy perspective and from ethical perspective, which is the focus of today's session. I'm just going to quickly go through each of these uh, steps, just highlight some of the main points and considerations uh, involved in this uh, framework. Well, first we need to decide how we're going to go about collecting social media data. So more technical question would be uh, to say, well, are we going to use a publicly available mechanisms such as API provided by social media platforms to collect data? Uh, what's their limit, uh, rate limit? Uh, are we able to capture all of it or are we collecting biased samples? Or how do we properly sample social media data? Uh, or do we have budget to go and buy data from data resellers? Uh, who in fact might be actually cleaning up their data sets because they are required to remove any messages that were deleted by users themselves. So again, you, you might, might or might not study in a true representation of uh, online conversations at the time. You might have access or develop applications to collect your own data um, from social media users. So that can be a data source for you as well. And then if you have multiple data sources or study in multiple platforms, the question is related to how do you combine data sets, uh, would you want to uh, de-identify users, and so on and so forth. So once you collected the data or during the collection process, you also have to consider where do you're going to store it and how do you organize uh, the records. So there's, luckily there are lots of cloud computing services and distributed systems out there from Amazon Web Services to Microsoft Azure systems. Uh, and there are a wide variety of databases that are emerging that can support large scale live data set that come in from social media. So I think on the technical side, we're well served by, uh, by technology here. But then comes analysis part. So what do we do with social media data? How do we make sense of it? So there's a wide variety of techniques, qualitative, quantitative techniques, and there are also a wide variety of tools to perform such analysis. Popular ones, as probably you heard, Python and R, uh, they have a wide variety of libraries developed uh, for data scientists to analyze uh, data sets, including those that come from social media data. But there are also uh, applications such as the one we develop in Athletic, as well as uh, companies like IBM, IBM Watson Analytics tools allows uh, non-programmers to still collect and analyze, so analyze social media data. And what I want to highlight here, the important part, as we see it in the lab, is the visualization part of this data. Because the data sets are often unstructured, multi-dimensional, visualizations, we find it a very effective way to get sense of what's happening in online community, what topics or actors are emerging. Uh, so this is some of the questions we would have to consider during the collection and analysis stage. Now, let's say we completed this study, we're ready to publish it. Well, quite often the practice is to attach your data sets so that to your publication so that other researchers can replicate the study, validate it, uh, or use it for other, to answer other questions. Well, unfortunately, there are lots of restrictions in terms of what social media platforms tell us we cannot do with uh, data sets, we cannot publish data sets. Uh, but uh, there are also uh, just a lack of a project that uh, develops standards and infrastructure that can handle uh, social media data sets from both technical and ethical issues. What we heard is, for example, the project, infamous project from Library of Congress that uh, had the ambitious goal of archive all, all tweets. Uh, so there are, were very few updates. Last time I saw was uh, you know, around 2013. 
So there's nothing to report there yet. Plus, even when, when and if it's available uh, by Library of Congress, such archive will not be accessible to researchers necessarily to go and analyze it. A Wayback Machine, you probably have seen that website. It's part of Internet, part of Internet Archive. Uh, platform, they do uh, random, well, pseudo-random samples of various Twitter streams. Very limited in scope. It's not representative. Uh, please, please come on in. Uh, so it's not well fitted uh, and uh, not reliable for the, for us researchers or even other decision makers to use those data sets. Well, finally, there are data resellers, companies like DataSift or Gnip from Twitter. They're cost prohibitive. Most of us might not have budgets to get access to those data. I want to also highlight one of the um, major examples of social media archive that more or less have a coherent representation of, in this case, tweets posted by the previous White House administration. Um, the archive is run by a private company, but it allows you to search and sift through all these archive messages by the previous administration. So that's a nice example. But there are also a lot of smaller data sets that publish self archived by researchers and published from their websites or data repositories. Uh, those are very limited in terms of scope, number of records. And as you can see, most of these examples are very Twitter specific, which is um, you know, a big limitation uh, from the uh, preservation perspective, because Twitter is actually not the biggest social media platform. So we're missing out a lot of publicly available and publicly important data out there that can be lost. All right, so I quickly walk you through all the main steps that we are considering as part of this social media data stewardship uh, uh, framework and part, uh, the same name for our initiative. And what we're saying here that all each of these steps uh, has to include ethical considerations. Again, because we use, we're working with user-generated data. Uh, we have to consider, well, do we have to ask for consent from users, even if the data is publicly available? Or can, when we publish in social media data, uh, ha, do we only publish aggregated view of data? So those are ethical and re relevant questions for us to answer, not just technical questions. And at this point, I would like to invite uh, Priya to tell you a little bit more about ethical uh, considerations and current frameworks that exist that can help us answer such questions. So please, Priya. Thank you, Anthony. Okay, so for human subject research as it stands today in Canada, research that involves human participants is governed by the Tri-Council Policy Statement, and that is the Ethical Conduct for Research Involving Humans, the TCPS. Now, we're talking about one part of the TCPS as it pertains to our research, internet research, right? So, uh, research ethic board reviews is also, it's not required where research uses exclusively publicly available information that may contain identifiable information and for which there is no reasonable expectation of privacy. So, cyber material, so documents, records, performances, online archives, or published third party interviews to which the public is given uncontrolled access on the internet for which there is no expectation of privacy is considered to be publicly available information. But, and there's a big but here, there are publicly accessible digital sites where there is a reasonable expectation of privacy, right? So when we talk about identifiable information or digital sites such as internet chat rooms or self-help uh, groups with restricted membership, there is a privacy expectation of the contributors of these sites. It's much higher. And in that case, researchers should submit their proposals for research ethics board review. And another but that comes out here, where data linkages of different sources of publicly available information is involved, it could give rise to new forms of ident uh, identifiable information that would raise issues of privacy and then second, confidentiality when used in research, and therefore would also require a REV review. Now, going back to our social media data stewardship project, what we're advocating for is looking at ethical considerations across the research process to develop a conceptual model of social media data stewardship based on both industry and research practices, as well as the user's attitude and perceptions. So, 
you know, we look at that question of how do we define the expectation of privacy, and what we're advocating for is to ask users, that could be a way to uh, contribute to this uh, gap in the, in the research. So to move from the um, ethical, uh, ethical considerations here, we'll now consider some of the literature. What has been actually, uh, the landscape is, is uh, I'm going to go over it um, through a systematic review of literature that was conducted by Sue uh, Golder and colleagues. And in this systematic review, uh, it was a review of empirical studies that have considered the attitudes towards the ethics of research using social media. And so Sue Golder and colleagues looked through 16 databases and two internet search engines using a snowball strategy, uh, keywords like social media, ethics, qualitative research. And the papers that were excluded were discussion papers or individual lookups, uh, papers on privacy or security, such as cyber uh, bullying or bank fraud. So they retrieved uh, just under 4,000 records. And they found that 17 studies focused on the attitudes, the user attitudes, towards the ethics of research using social media. So what did the literature show? Well, the literature showed that reactions to social media uh, actually vary. So we see in uh, Evans 2015, it found that users, 60% of them, had a negative reaction to social media for research. Uh, that same year, a publication by Williams in 2015 found that users, 63% uh, of them had a negative reaction to social media for research purposes, 37% uh, uh, had a positive reaction to social media for research purposes. Uh, a few years prior, a study conducted by Moreno in 2012 found that 50% uh, of users had a negative reaction to social media for research purposes, 29% had a neutral reaction, and 56% had a positive reaction to social media for research. And so what we see here is that there's a lack of consensus on the attitudes towards the ethics of using uh, social media for research purposes. And we can all think of a few reasons as to why these discrepancies, we can note them, or what might be potential factors that could explain these differing attitudes. First of all, it might be a question of research project focus. So certain subjects, maybe public has a different attitude towards health-related research or market research, for example. Uh, different methodological techniques, so qualitative or quantitative techniques, they might differ or, or capture different attitudes. The type of platform being used, um, the type of data or information being studied, and also who are the participants engaging in these studies? Are they social media users? Are they lurkers? Uh, are they researchers? So all these factors might explain these discrepancies in, in, in users' atti attitudes towards the ethics of social media research. So from this systematic uh, literature review, there were some key takeaways, and that was that social media research ethics, for right now, there's not a one-size-fits-all framework. There isn't a clear framework on how to proceed. Uh, there's complex boundaries between publicly available data and what is considered to be individual privacy. There's a lack of understanding on how to maintain anonymity, uphold confidentiality. And what we're trying to do here is we want to uncover and analyze other factors that might influence users' attitudes towards social media research. Now, some of the factors that we're examining in the social media data stewardship, uh, well, we're interested whether and how users' privacy expectations depend on who's using their information, uh, second of all, for what purposes and what types of information. And again, our focus is on publicly available social media data. Now, I'm going to turn this over to Jenna, and she's going to uh, discuss the group activity. Okay. Thank you, Priya. Um, in today's workshop, we're going to be specifically focusing on exploring different data types. Um, so rather than just assuming, right now the current framework is it's public, it's publicly available information, this is on social media, it's free to use and you can use that in, in, in any way. That's the way that, um, as Priya has explained, the Research Ethics Board currently has it. But we want to find out, is there a difference? Um, is it okay to use this information? Is it dependent on uh, who is using the data? Is it dependent on for what purpose the data is being used, as well as what data itself? 
And this is something that um, people often don't consider, but social media data is not a monolithic thing. It's not just one type of data. There's many different data types that we can actually get. Um, so in order to provide a bit of context here, I'm going to show you a few examples of social media use and perhaps misuse. This would be up, up to your discretion. Um, in 2017, Facebook announced that it would be begin using photo matching systems um, in order to prevent intimate, intimate images that were posted without permission from being reshared on Facebook. So in this situation, the who is Facebook. Facebook is conducting this activity um, for the purpose of blocking inappropriate content. And what information is they're using users' photographs? Another example um, comes from American law enforcement who are using social media monitoring firm Geofedia, um, their services, to monitor protest activity. Um, and this uses location-based information for real-time response and profiling of individuals. So here, again, the WHO is the security agency for the purpose of identifying real or potential um, threats and what information. This is just location-based information. Uh, the last example uh, that I'll um, go through is the car insurance company Admiral UK um, using Facebook posts and likes in order to set the car insurance price for their users. So you could um, elect to open, to show your Facebook profile and based on how many exclamation marks and selfies that you're posting, this will actually determine your personality type, which can then be used to set your car insurance um, rate. So in this activity, what we're going to be doing is we're going to break up into three groups. And each group is going to discuss what they think users' comfort level will be with third parties using social media data. Um, and the reason why we're doing this is afterwards, uh, we actually have an ongoing um, nationwide survey. Um, currently, we have about 1,100 responses. So we're going to be presenting some of the initial findings that are like literally coming in as we, as we speak. Um, and this is pulling apart. So the first group is going to be looking at who. So they'll discuss the sensitivity and comfort um, of different data consumers about different uh, government, researchers, um, whoever may be using this information, and how comfortable do you think that you would be with um, the government versus a researcher using your social media data? Um, the second group is going to be looking at for what purpose. They're going to be discussing the sensitivity of using social media for specific purposes, like uh, getting your insurance uh, car quote, or whether it is for a credit check. The final group is going to look at what information. Um, not all social media data is equal. Do we consider po our photos, our location, our network data to be more or less sensitive? And the, the activity is an attempt to show or perhaps figure out whether you think um, that social media, media data is not equal and it really is contextual based on a whole lot of different factors. So each group, as you'll see in front of you, has a board um, that ranges from extremely comfortable to extremely uncomfortable. As a group, um, depending on which group you're in, you're going to be given these cards. Um, let's just say you, you have the data consumer, the who. You're going to be given a card, and the card is then going to say on it, uh, government, journalist. And as a group, you're going to decide where do you think that you would feel comfortable with, with your publicly available social media data being used. So again, we're not talking about information that is you know, locked down on your private accounts, but we're, but we're speaking about information that is already out there that technically, as researchers, you could use. You could very freely use it. Governments can freely use this, so the information is available already. Um, each group is going to have about 20 minutes to discuss, and then we'll have a representative from each group um, present the findings, and hopefully, hopefully we'll have a few diff differing opinions on what we see as comfortable and uncomfortable. Uh, you also have in front of you little sticky notes if you want to take any notes or any points of contention um, that, that the group is currently experiencing.
Okay, so let's see. So this is um, this is data as of yesterday. Um, we have in this sample 1,079 Canadians um, on there. The sample is going to be larger, but this is the, the group that has so far um, responded. We have as so the blue represents the range of the responses of these 1,000 people, and the the little orange triangle represents the mean response. So just at a top level, you can see is people are the most comfortable with academic researchers. So I guess give us ourselves a round of applause. We are considered a little bit more trusted than the rest, than the rest to use our publicly available requirements Is your sample, though, is, are they students and academics? No, this is, this is a nationally representative sample. So we have cross-Canada samples of, you know, equal representation from the various provinces, French-speaking, English-speaking, cross-Canada. Um, then, uh, leaning slightly towards the more uncomfortable, we have person use of date, um, customs and border officer, legal, journalist, your employer, or potential employer, insurance company, and then the most, the furthest towards uncomfortable, we have marketer, financial institution, political party, and government. So your government one fits in there. Um, yeah, some, a lot of similar similar responses there on what you think and a couple of differences. Um, so in, as we go forward with this research, once we have the full, the full data set, we're then going to look at, well, what specific variables play into this, right? Not just the average responses, but do um, men um, versus women or younger people, how, how does this play into this, this equation? Yeah, are you looking at income? So, you know, Class, so social class. Yeah, so we have full full demographic data as well. So people are, you know, whether you're looking for a job, whether you have a job, what political party you're affiliated with, where you come from, your social socioeconomic, mm -hmm. um, all of that data to see what what factors actually play into your your uh, description of of comfort. Okay, this is for what purpose? We don't quite have all of ours on the on the board, but for the ones that are are up on the board. We can see again academic research is a little is a little bit more, but actually still not comfortable here. It's in the like, well, maybe it depends category. Um, in the same line as opinion mining about products or services, customer relations, suicide prevention, so that one is well aligned, and public health monitoring. Then we move slightly more uncomfortable for things like homeland security identifying at-risk behavior, law enforcement, screening job applicants. So, how do we do with that one? Yeah, yeah quite similar. Uh, supporting legal cases, political polling, quoting and news stories. This is an increasingly interesting topic, I think. Um, monitoring employees' messages, um, border crossing and visa applications, and then we take the next step over, and these are all relating to finances, credit check, insurance claims, financial loan review, so you kind of have a, a, a neat little cluster there of people saying, relating to information, uh, relating to money, no thank you. You know, we talk about social media data, and we go into other sessions today or in the future, when we talk about just publicly available social media data, the fact that we can break, that we could have each had these conversations about not just what data, but who's using it, and for what, and for what specific purpose, really shows us that the data is, is certainly not equal, and we shouldn't be looking at it in equal ways, even in our own research. Um, so with that, um, let's get that. Um, if this is a topic that is of interest to you, um, at the Social Media and Society Conference, there's always a really strong conversation surrounding um, ethics. And actually, the day before the conference, um, we're having a specialist meeting um, which is specifically focused on uh, looking at the, some of the ethical implications and then also some of the technical the technical side that's involved in social media data collection. So if that's something that's interesting to you, please feel free to come up afterwards um, and chat to us. And if you um, are interested, there's also opportunities to come and, come and visit, visit the lab in Toronto, spend some time there, work on some collaborative projects um, together because in addition to there being lots of different ethical considerations, there's also technical considerations. So if there's things that you're thinking about, we'd be happy to chat afterwards. So um, hopefully we can use the last maybe two minutes or so to just wrap up. If there's any questions you have within your own groups, feel free to, to chat. 
Otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you.